Hello and welcome. I have got a half done presentation, but the way that I'm going to fix my presentation live in front of you is going to be part of the way that you'll learn how to use IPython Notebook. Um, is basically just installation issues. Python by default is basically installed on any computer you can probably, that you're using right now because Windows isn't allowed. And you would execute it by writing Python and then you get the interpreter shell. And we've already seen how interpreted languages work like Node where you can just start writing commands here. Uh, also interrupt me at any time, by the way. So that's just that and then we could also do something like um, write Python files that end in .py and uh, uh, like this. This is a uh, Python demo.py print hello world. But that's good enough. Okay. And we can execute them. like this by calling Python on the thing. But I'm going to skip all of that right now because we've already seen how to do that with Node and we're going to jump straight into the IPython notebook. And the way that you would start that is you go into the directory from which you want your IPython notebook files to be stored and you would write IPython notebook and then hopefully that will create a web server running locally and then you can start using your stuff in the browser. Uh, you start editing in the IPython notebook. And this is great for a couple of reasons. And it basically melds, uh, so like here is an IPython thing. It melds a multi-line editor with, so this is a multi-line editor with also being an inter a, a live interpreter. So like you get all the things at once. It's like the two things I did earlier, but all in the same thing. Uh, so don't be afraid of IPython notebook, and I'll speak more about it as we go on. But for now, I'm just gonna show you. It also could those other things like, uh, I can start, I type in mark down here, and uh, then when I execute it, oops, I should get like something. And then I execute it, and so then it all comes live in the browser. But forget that for now. Okay, so I'm going to talk about Python today, and I'm going to demo it. Most, I'm going to give you a short introduction to some of the syntax, and then the thing that I'm going to give as an example is I'm going to show how you would write the Google uh, did you mean thing in which is like if I write the word in correct, like, uh, incorrect. It like knows that I mean incorrect. And I'm going to show you how to do that in 21 lines of Python. And in fact, I'm not really going to do it, but I'm going to show you the explanation by Peter Norvig, who is the head of research at Google, who I don't care for that much, but the tutorial that he showed on how to do this in 21 lines of Python is quite interesting. And I think that will be instructive to show the expressive power of Python about how you can do something so powerful so quickly. Yes? Can you back up and give us a few words on why Python? Okay, I'm going to do that. The first reason why Python is because Monty Python is the client circuits. the 
and you get to make as many Monty Python jokes as you like while programming. And the humor is part of hacker culture and one that I find is underrepresented. So that's one of the reasons. And it's really named after Monty Python. Um, now I'm going to give you another reason why I'm teaching you Python. And then I will give a reason about why Python. So this video is called um, Programming is Terrible, Lessons Learned from a Life Wasted. And he talks a bit about introductions to languages. And I'm going to play this. I think that this is a really clever way to think about which language you should use. Click static void main. You've given hope, given up absolute hope of trying to get us to understand and then straight off. Is what do you want to create? What do you want to build? Okay. Sitting down with somebody else who asks the most amazing click static void main. You've given hope given up absolute hope of trying to get us to understand, trying to be engaged, trying to learn, or trying, even being enthusiastic, the only thing that would save his face was everyone getting at least one mark in the exam. Okay, so now the part that everyone wants to show up again. You can see the difference okay. between like adult education and child education. Adult education, if people don't like it, they leave. In child education, if people don't like it, we send the police for it. Really, there's a sort of lack of respect for learners. There's this whole sort of, I know best. Personally, I've learned the most that I have about programming from sitting down with somebody else who asks the most amazing questions, and I have to think about what I'm doing. I haven't learned anything from being on my own, or just assuming that I know everything from the beginning. So really, if somebody asks me, I want to learn how to program, my first question, and it should be a question that you ask rather than telling them straight off, is what do you want to create? What do you want to build? So, just on a bit of uh, random unsolicited advice, if you do want to learn programming, find the languages and the tools that your friends use, because otherwise you're going to be screwed when you need help. Find something that's easy to install. Find something that doesn't require going through a 300 page manual on how to open a certain dialog box and navigate through the menus, it's just not fun. Don't worry about object orientation, functional programming, and all of the crazy things that some of your friends with weird hair are talking about. <laughs> really, learning to program should be about play. It should be getting things up and running in an afternoon and seeing what happens. It should really just be about poking things and uh, hopefully not crushing your computer. Learning programming shouldn't be the means to an end. It should be something you're doing in order to do something actually fun. So that's basically it. So the language that you should learn is the one that your friends know. This is the one that I happen to know best, but there's many others. And it should be the one that like, is not just a means to an end, but it's like you enjoy the means itself, which is fun. And I'm going to go on a small detour because, oh, I think he talks, I just mentioned title graphics. There's a nice joke here. Now, I've touched on the idea of learning through play, but what I like to suggest to people, they get a sandboxed environment. They find, like, have you, has anybody ever used Logo or a Turtle Graphics? Yeah. Keep your hand up if that was the first language you ever started. Yeah, yeah that's why you're stuck with it. <laughs> <laughs> that's why you've never escaped programming. It was so much fun in the beginning, and you've been trying to find and recapture that ever since. <laughs> I know. Okay, so. I actually didn't title the graphics as my first programming language, but I'm going to switch to it now. To oh, I don't have very good resolution, but um, because so many other people have used title graphics, that um, it kind of feels like I was used title graphics myself. And the way that title graphics works, if you don't know, is um, you have a turtle on the screen, which is here, and then you have a program, and then you have these boxes that you can like combine. And then the commands are like repeat, oops, forward, right, or, and then you can do forward and right, and then you specify parameters for them. And so if I just run this program, which is repeat eight times, go forward 100 pixels, turn right 45 degrees, go forward 50, go 90, I get this. So the turtle is like going around. Oops. And like following those commands eight times. And this is like really fun for kids. And then I'm going to clear the thing. And then I'm going to take the 
I'm going to replace, after the start program, I replace this block, which is, and then let's replace this one. Repeat four times, go right forward, and then off, and then do this thing, and then repeat it. So like, you can see how I'm building up a language without writing anything. Uh, and I'll take the stop action here. I run the turn on. So then I get something that looks like like an early Islamic design maybe or something. So it did the first thing and now it's in the outer loop. You can see it's also highlighting these things as it executes them. So I think that my point here was that I had Substack, maybe you can comment me, but I think JavaScript was kind of your turtle, or maybe turtle graphics was your turtle graphics, and then JavaScript was your turtle graphics.
and so this is a different block. And so indenting uh, four spaces goes in a block, and so like the way, the reason that you don't have to do this is because everything that is indented past the white space is part of the if, and everything that isn't is not part of the if. And that's how white space works in Python, and I think it's a very elegant solution, and it doesn't pollute your code with a lot of curly brackets, and you don't have to worry about finishing them. So the readability, this is what makes it very readable. Uh, so what is Python good at? show you a bit more on this. And it has like very few, it can just like intelligent, it just like, its it syntax is very close to English. Um, so this is the even function. So this is, a, this is how you do a function definition. Uh, you write def, that's the keyword to define a function. This is the name, these are the arguments. When you make a new block, this is the only thing that I think is a little bit inelegant, is that when you make a new block, you have to use a colon. So that is like the, equivalent of the curly braces. And so so this is a new, we've defined a new block, and so that everything that is to the right more indented than death is part of the death. And so all of this is part of the death. And then we have an if statement. And if expects a conditional to be here. So we don't, in JavaScript you have to do this. But in Python you don't, because everything between the if and the colon is the conditional. And then you don't have to put the curly braces because everything that's to the right of the if is the if statement. And then, so actually this is not correct syntax. This is the correct syntax. So this is the if block. And then, so this only gets executed if this condition is true, which is a modulo 2 equals 0. So that would be an even number. And then it has this return statement. Uh, I'm not going to go over all the function types or, or the types because they're basically the same as JavaScript, and that's not very interesting. Although I would go, I will go over a new type a bit later. And so then this is no longer in the if statement, so the if was 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 not true, so it must not be an even number. And even numbers, well, even not, numbers that are not even are odd, with one exception. Well, zero is by convention defined to be odd. But anyway, so yeah, so this is the even statement. This is what our function definition might look like in Python. Any questions so far? Okay, I will continue motivating Python's nice syntax. Man, multiple assignment, I missed this in JavaScript, and I didn't think it was useful. But if you want to define two variables, like this, is, I can write a equals, by the way, spam and x come from Monty Python, if you've seen the spam script. So instead of writing a equals spam, b equals x, uh, I, in two lines, if I want to assign things, I can, there's another nice convenience feature is this multiple assignment, where I just write a comma b is equal, the things, the pair on the left is equal to the pair on the right. And I will execute that now. And you'll see that this works for arbitrary length. when we iterate over dictionaries, uh, which I'll explain a bit more later. So another thing that I think is really nice, and it kind of pained me to help people out with over the course, is four loops that look like this. Uh, and so this is basically how you would do it in C, or how you might have been taught to do it in JavaScript. I wish that you would have never learned that ever, because I don't think it's like just bug prone and there are better ways to do something for every list in the group. And you may need to do this, but the, the special case is not special enough. What does it say? Special cases aren't special enough to break the rules. So there are special cases where you might need to use this kind of idiom, or th this kind of for loop. Uh, but you could, and you could do this in Python, and in Python it would look like this. Uh, instead of um, setting all the, the, the 
iterator variable, initializing the iterator variable, the condition, and then what to do at the end of the loop, and then doing something on the list, and then calling the iterator variable index position on the list. In Python, you could do that. You set the iterator variable, you set the condition, and then you like increment the iterator variable at the end. Um, while that works, it's not considered, and then there's this term, Pythonic, and that it's not an idiom of the Python language. You could even make it a bit more Python, Pythonic by using the Python for statement, which says, and the Python for statement says, you write the for, then you write the variable that you want to iterate over, that the name of the variable that will be iterated over. You write the keyword in, and then you write an iterable, and I'll explain what an iterable is a bit later on, but for the moment, just think of that as a list. Uh, and in this case, it's the length of the list, and then you might do something for that list. But that's not even Pythonic either, because um, in the Python, you're encouraged to just let the language understand what you want to do. So in Python, this is really what you do. You'd say, for elements, so this is, you're declaring this, in my list, do something on the element. So I will show you Oops. That, this is how elegant it is, right? So, um, if I have, okay, so like my list is equal to one, two, three. So I'll say for, um, you know, num in, well, let's call this nums. For num number, normally another Pythonic thing is that you call the list the plural thing and then you call the element the singular of the plural. So for num, number in numbers, print number. And that's how you iterate over things and there's no curly braces and you can't fuck up the iteration by like declaring the, um, by declaring the, by doing this wrong. It just like, let the program do it correct for you. So, that's really nice. Okay, so, I'm not sure if this is useful, but I was, when I applied to hacker school, their first thing is like, do a, this like classic example, which is like, uh, um, foo baz bar, fizz bars? Okay. So, I'll show you how, I was just going to use this as an example for nested loops because I thought about this for a really long time. Some, like asking somebody to do fizzbuzz that's been programming for years was like a, a recipe for me to like think about how the very best way to do fizzbuzz was. Um, and I don't even like this solution. Um, so what I did was, so this is a dictionary and the dictionaries look exactly the same as in Python as in JavaScript. Uh, I think it's almost, it's exactly the same. Does anybody know? Okay. Where you have like the, the curly braces. So the curly braces in Python mean dictionary. And dictionary, sorry, means object in JavaScript parlance. And dictionary and object in human parlance mean key value, a set of key value pairs. Where the key is the first thing and the um, value is the second thing, and there are many of them. And so, like, this is the first key value pair, and this is the second key value pair. So, I iterate over range gives me all the numbers from this. If you just specify a single uh, with one argument, then it's just the end, and it starts from zero. So, then print i, and then I did. So, Rice Krispies is my dictionary, and then I, every step of every number. So now you're seeing a nested loop. So this is all the outer for loop. And then I to create a new create a new for loop. And this is all the inner for loop. And I go for okay, so I'll run this, but above it I'm going to show you what rice krispies dot keys looks like. And that gives you the keys, which is all these things. And then I can also do values. And then it also has this thing called items. And that's a list 
and every element in the list is a list of length two, where the key is the first thing and the pair, and the value is the second thing. Um, so then I would iterate over the keys of the Rice Krispies, and I would check to see if the number was a divisor of the flake. So the flake is the current number, and if that was true, then you know I would print out the buzz or the fizz or the crackle. Or anyway, so that's just I'm just showing you how nesting works in Python in this example. And I'll show you how IPython notebook works with a lot of output because you can just uh, collapse that. Okay, I don't remember what I was doing here. So I declared 100. Oh, I wanted to show you how list comprehension works next, but I think I gave up on that as well. Okay, uh, but I do need to show you how list comprehension works. Okay, I, I do show you how list comprehension works in fact in this. So. Even better than the for loop. Doesn't it, it gets better than the for loop in that there's this thing called list comprehension. And it's really cool because it's just so expressive about you're expressing your idea. Like when you make a list, normally you want to get back a list. Or sometimes you don't. But in the cases that you have a list and you want to get back a list and do something for everything in a list and then have the result be a list, you have this comprehension. So, um, so this is this is a hundred numbers, a hundred and one actually. So the way that the list comprehension works is you say for 